Welcome to Elevate, the masterclass where we dissect the elements of exceptional achievement and lifestyle design with a focus on personal growth and real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Tyler Chesser. Elevate Nation, welcome back. This is Tyler Chesser. I'm so thankful to have you here and I'm blessed and grateful to be sitting here with my friend, Jason Stucker. Jason, how are you? I'm doing great, Tyler. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here and looking forward to having a great conversation. It'll Maybe it's going to be like our coffee meetings that we have at times, which it occurred to me that I've got to share these because we have some great discussions and uh, I think Elevate Nation's in for a real treat today. So really appreciate you taking time. And I want to welcome Elevate Nation back because it's time to take it to another level. We're absolutely going to be raising the bar today. And as you know, our mission is to identify and apply how the best of the best raise the bar personally and professionally to achieve greatness in real estate and beyond. And we're going to talk mindset, habits, routines, systems, tactics, you name it, strategies, um, you know, really navigating an uncertain environment, uh, you know, from, a, from an individual right now who is a master at what he does, uh, someone who's really elevating to a life without limits and helping others do the same. And as you know, also, this is a masterclass for leaders and those looking to achieve uncommon results and purposeful outcomes through real estate investing and ultimately in their lives. And if you appreciate what we're doing, we'd certainly be grateful if you subscribe to the show, if you give us a rating, a review. It helps us because our goal is to reach millions and millions of people with this message that you don't have to live a life that you tolerate. You can actually live a life that you are filled by, that you can have a life filled with joy and abundance and opportunities. And we think it's the combination of personal and professional growth along with successfully investing in real estate. And so I want to dive in here. I want to introduce you to Jason Stucker, who earned his bachelor degree from the University of Kentucky, Go Cats, and his MBA from Bellarmine University. He currently serves as the Louisville Market President for Fork Bank. As a market executive, he oversees the commercial banking and retail banking operation, as well as the community development efforts. He is also a current member of Leadership Louisville Center and graduate of their two signature leadership programs, Ignite Louisville and Leadership Louisville. He's also been involved and served in several local nonprofits, including the March of Dimes, Catholic Charities, and Trinity High School. In 2019, he was appointed as a board member of the Department of Financial Institutions in Kentucky. Jason was recognized as one of the 20 people to know in finance by Business First and also recognized in 2014, 40 under 40. He is married to Andrea Stucker, a CPA, and they have two children, Hampton and Hadley. So with that said, Jason, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit more about yourself behind the bio. Who is Jason as a man? Uh, Tyler, first, I want to thank you for inviting me. And, and I think I said before we start recording you know, you've had some unbelievable guests and you go, I got the email invite from you. And I, I said, you know, me, really, you really want me on in the show? And, you know, no, I, I didn't want to come on as the boring banker, but, but also share some of the things I'm doing. And, and, uh, but, but really I first and foremost want to thank you for having me on. I really do appreciate the invite and, and hopefully your listeners will get some, uh, some uh, interesting takeaways from this, this podcast. And again, I'm thrilled to be a part of it today. So thank you very much. And, you know, background, I mean, I, I mean, I grew up here in Louisville, Kentucky, like a lot of people uh, in this town, uh, it stays pretty local. Uh, uh, grew up over in the Heights Point area, uh, local high schools, then went to the University of Kentucky. I fortunately met a, uh, an amazing woman from West Virginia that ended up being my wife. And uh, post-graduation, we moved back to Louisville. Uh, she's a CPA. And then I found a job in banking. And from there, it's 17 years later. That's where we are now. We've got two lovely kids, my son Hampton, who's 11, and my daughter uh, Hadley, who just turned nine. We had a quarantine birthday over the weekend, so that was a little different. But that's kind of what we're doing now. And, um, but really having a great time, spending some great time with my family. We're staying, staying safe and healthy. But first and foremost, we've been busy. You know, I have many people ask me, Tyler, you know, uh, What's it been like over the last month or six weeks? And it's been the busiest four weeks probably that I've ever worked in banking. And uh, where a lot of people, a lot of your local bankers or community bankers have been extremely busy. And then it kind of goes back to really that last, that last couple of weeks in February where you start to see some, some turmoil in the markets. And from there, it's been a roller coaster to where we are right now. So it's been a challenging six or seven weeks, but it's been a fast six or seven weeks. And and we're really still learning as we go and, and doing the best we can right now. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I can totally relate to you in so many ways, you know, especially since the the market has shifted so drastically, uh, as you mentioned, over the past, you know, seven weeks or so. Um, you know, the whole world has changed 180 degrees, you know, the market is totally different than it was in, you know, mid to late February. And it's just, it's fascinating to watch and really to look back. And, and it, it's also interesting is that most of us in the space have just gotten so busy and especially folks in your shoes uh, as an executive in the banking industry, you know, I certainly just want to honor you for all that you've done. I mean, I think about uh, some of the things that we've tried to do um, as individuals is like, who, who can we give back to? Who can we help during this time? And the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, healthcare workers, obviously we want to try to give to them. And, and uh, you know, one thing that we did was we actually just, we bought dinner for some healthcare workers in the ER recently and we sent them dinner uh, at night shift. And it just, it felt good to do because they're on the front lines, right? They're fighting this pandemic. Then I also think of who else? I mean, you know, folks in the uh, supermarket industry, it's like, man, they're, they're stocking the shelves. I mean, we still, need our food, right? And I also think about bankers. I mean, to be honest with you, uh, you know, folks in the banking industry have just been working so much overtime. So I just want to honor you and everyone else in that space right now by just saying that and, and reminding folks listening, you know, go just tell your banker thank you today because they are doing so much to, uh, to bring us opportunities in the midst of these challenges and to navigate this challenge. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to make a mention of that. But, but back to you, Jason, more importantly, Talk to me about you as an individual, someone who's been so driven to achieve excellence in your life and in your career. Was there a moment in your life that you'd say that you really kind of, you, you drew that theoretical line in the sand and said, you know what, I'm not going to accept average. I'm not going to accept mediocre. I'm going to strive for excellence because you just, you're always that, you really are that person who does continually raise the bar in your own life. So I'd love to just kind of dive into that just briefly. So, Tyler, I think the, 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 you know, my story would be one of, of hope for maybe late bloomers, people that uh, maybe go through grade school, high school, that have potential or have uh, talent, and, may, and maybe they're not using it to the best of their ability, and, and, and maybe just don't have the focus at that point. And so I went that route, and I, had, I, did, I participated and had a lot of activities in, in high school, and then went to college. And then probably for the first two or three years, and even in college, there still wasn't that focus or drive. And, you know, I, I'm lucky that I have uh, two great, amazing uh, parents, my mom and dad, and my dad's just a hard worker. My mom's a hard worker. So I grew up in that, that household where, you know, where e even on spring break where all the kids were going down to Florida, we never went to spring break. Dad would, he, he would have a list of chores to do in the morning, and it was a list. And you had to, everything had to be off that list before you could do anything. And in, in most cases, we didn't, we didn't cross off all those items before we even got home. So the list rolled over to the next day. So I remember just very early on, you know, thankful that my parents uh, did instill the, the work ethic that you have to work hard. Now, for me individually, it didn't really kick in until probably I graduated. I moved back home, and then you stuck with this reality of like, okay, well, everything that I thought I wanted to do before going to college, now I need to do that. And, and how do I do that? And, and, you know, like anybody else, especially if you're a senior or you're, you're in college now or you're an entry-level position, you know, what are you, what are you, what are you looking to do? And, you know, I was very lucky. I found something that I was very interested in. And I think that in, in your podcast and the people that you've interviewed, I think the one underlying uh, factor that you see that you can kind of trade, you can kind of trace back to everybody has been the passion and love of what they do. And, and that's so significant because it, it sounds kind of hokey sometimes to say that, but it's really hard to, to be great at something if you don't love it. It's really hard to be passionate about something if, 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 if you don't love doing that. And, and I really love what I do. I'm very, very, very lucky that, um, that it's a rewarding job. You know, I work as a community banker, which is a little different than some of the regional banks, but, but we have some similarities that cross over. And, and it's really, um, you know, when I graduated from Kentucky, it took me about a year to find a job. I did some job placement exams. And then, and then one of them came back and said, hey, maybe you should do something in banking. And so I was interested and applied at several banks. They had a few opportunities. Ended up taking a job at a regional bank entry level position, you know, you start at the bottom, which is fine. I was happy just to start and, and get an opportunity. And I loved it. They did they provided excellent training as most of the regional banks will do. But but the one thing I couldn't stand was that you had to go to Seattle to get approval for this. Or then you had to send this form to Cincinnati. You had to send this form to Minnesota. This form had to go to it was all everything had to go all over the place. And a customer that came in, if you came in directly to me and had a question and you needed me to help fix something or address an issue, I couldn't do that. And so I was very frustrated by that, but I loved everything else about banking. 
And then I remember thinking one day, I was like, you know, my wife and I are at church, and I'm sitting there praying. I was like, is there something else I could be doing? And do I even need to, do I even want to do this? I like it, but, but I, I don't like the regional part of it, right? And so um, I saw a job opportunity for assistant manager at, at Stockyards Bank. So I applied for that and, and, uh, and got that job. And then from there, I had several different jobs at Stockyards over a seven-year career at Stockyards. It kind of, it kind of catapulted me into my position now. So I'm very, very blessed and thankful for those opportunities. But, uh, but that really started, you know, and, and then I think from there, um, you, you know, but going back to your first question, I mean, I, I just really went off the rails on that. But, I love it. you know, I, I, always, I always believe that because I think that, you know, I was surrounded. I went to a school, and you're always going to be surrounded by people in high school or college or even post-college that, that have that, that already kind of know what they want to do. And that's excellent. That's great. But I think that there is uh, – there is an opportunity for people that are late bloomers that don't know what they want to do when they're 23 or 24 and they can find that and, and, and still do extremely well with uh, what they want to do. Are you someone who's seriously looking to elevate your life, your business, your real estate portfolio, your cash flow, your deal opportunities, your access to opportunities, your network this year? Well, if that's you, then I invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com because I'm currently opening up a few coaching spots for people like you who want to close the gap from where you are to where you want to be and really, you know, expand that beyond your wildest dreams and explode your business, explode your deal opportunities, explode your vision for what you're looking to create. If that's you, I invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com. I really have to tell you that this is not for everyone. This is only for those who are decisive. They're committed. They're willing to do whatever it takes. They're willing to invest time, energy, and resources into themselves to get to where they want to be and to live a life without limits, to elevate to a life without limits, which is really what we're all about on this show. If that is you, again, I invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com. Again, that's coachwithtyler.com. That's actually really, really important because I know, you know, a lot of times, you know, people look back and they say, well, who are the high performers? And it's like, man, they knew when they were three years old that they were going to be what they became. And I think there's a lot of validity in what you're saying is that, you know, you don't have to just be from that boat. There's so many different ways to, you know, skin a cat, as they say. And, um, you know, you know, understanding that being a late bloomer is a possibility and that you can actually pivot from what you've tried before. So I love that you shared that. I, I mean, how did you understand? I mean, were, when you went through that process, did you understand that you were blooming late or did you think that, man, it's too late now and you, you maybe I'll just figure out what happens next and then you got lucky or how did that work for you? Well, I think it started with, um, you, you know, I, I'm very, very blessed because again, I, I think I told you about my wife, she's a CPA and it started early in our career. We got married when we were 25 and which I guess is kind of normal, you know, 15 years ago when we got married. And we dated in college, um, but she was, she was, um, she helped push me in, in a good way. You know, she wouldn't allow me to sit back and not do what I need to do. She knew that I could do more. And, and that was extremely helpful because there were several times where you go, well, it's, it's easy. Look, we're, we, we can all be lazy at, at certain things. And, and, and having someone push you is so important. So she was, she was, she was my pusher. And, in a good way. And, and I wouldn't be where I am today without her in so many different ways. And there's so many funny examples of, you know, of, of when, when I was like, I don't know if I'm going to go in and she, she, go do it. And then also to that point, you know, when I worked at Stockyards, um, you know, within a year or so, I got a job opportunity to move downtown to the commercial banking department as portfolio manager, which was excellent. It was like, it was like graduate school of banking. And I remember telling her I was so excited because I got a promotion and she was like, well, you know, I was telling her all the different things I was going to be doing. I'm going to be down in town corporate with access to the, you know, my office is going to be right around the corner from the CEO. And then these three executive vice presidents were going to be on the floor. I was going to be around all these different people, the people really making the decisions at the bank. So I was thrilled and so excited. And she, was, and I was telling her all this and she was like, well, how much, you know, so how much more money did you get? I said, no, 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 wait, no, you, you, you're missing it. It was all of these other things. And I, and I, but I, but I, but I think, it, you know, we were very lucky because again, we, she had a great job. Uh, the range really wasn't that great. I recognized at the time at 26 years old that it was more about the opportunity and not the money. And, 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 I, was, and I was right about that because I think today you see a lot of people that are focused on the opposite. and it's, it's The decisions are money driven and not based on the opportunity. And, and again, if you, get the, if you have the talent and the, and, and the opportunities are available, 
then, then, then the, the money piece will catch up at some point and, yeah. and always will. Um, and so I've always tried to tell people that in your 20s, your 20s are your years where you should be trying to earn as much experience as possible and trying to find the right opportunity where you can grow into an organization. And if you can't, then you need to look for an opportunity somewhere else. Yeah, no, that's great. And I love just highlighting the fact that your life partner was truly a partner beyond just, you know, having fun and pleasure, but somebody who's going to push you. So what is it that you can do, you know, the listener today, what, what can the listeners do to push their partner or, you know, put themselves in a position to where they're going to be pushed? That's going to pay off so much in the long term is get yourself in a place of a little bit of discomfort because I know, you know, most human beings are like you. It's like, well, I don't know if I should go in there for this one. I don't know if I should take this opportunity because it just doesn't feel like I'm ready. But it's so amazing when you have people that surround you that, you know, want to see you become the highest version of yourself, you know, what that can do for you. So I just want to challenge the listener to take an inventory of who are you surrounding yourself with and what sort of message are they putting in your mind? And so it's just a great reminder. I appreciate you sharing that, Jason. One thing um, I'd love to dive in with you. And the reason why I want to go here is because being a community banker, you know, I know I've, I've experienced this myself as an investor and as a real estate professional, how important relationships are. And it's even more important now, you know, like we're going through a market shift, a transition. And I've noticed that people who have invested in relationships, especially with their bankers, are the ones who are getting the attention. And bankers are in very high demand right now and trying to navigate these you know, unprecedented waters. So I'd love to just dive in a little bit. Uh, what would you say are some of the most important components of developing, you know, strong and lasting professional relationships? Well, I think it's, it's, it has to be a genuine relationship. I think in some cases we, we, get, we get lazy with, with technology or we get lazy with just texting and, and emailing. And, and I think that um, we've got to get back to some of the old ways. Now, again, it's going to take a while for that to happen. I'm not going to say that we're going to stop in and and have coffee with, with your best clients, you know, starting tomorrow. We do need to pick up the phone more and, and make sure that we are engaged and, and understand. But I think, you know, when you, when, you work at a, when you work at a community bank, I think that the, the, the great thing about it, Tyler, is that, you know, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm talking to an owner, I'm talking directly to an owner. And, and I think that that's, that's, a, that's an unbelievable experience, someone that maybe is starting a company. I've, I've got relationships right now, Tyler, that we started working with seven or eight years ago with 50,000 a year in sales or 15 million in sales. So they've grown their entire business over seven or eight years with, with extremely hard work and discipline and, and long hours and, and blood, sweat, and tears. The whole, everything that they do is, is remarkable. I've been able to, to tag along for the ride and watch it as well, providing financing and, 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 and financial advice when needed. But it's been, it, that's, that's extremely rewarding part of the job. And then you mentioned too, over the last six or seven weeks, when you see what the market has done, whether it initially was, hey, you know, the treasuries are falling, so is it, am I, am I going to reach out to my banker to look to refinance? And then it looked like, okay, now we're in something much, much different than a refinance situation. It's, yeah. I might need assistance with my payments in, in April, May, June, July, or even longer. I need to reach out to my banker and have that conversation. And then, and then it's even switched down to this, uh, you know, these SBA programs that have been rolled out over the last five weeks where it's been con uh, constant uh, communication between, you know, reaching out and saying, what, what do I need to do to qualify? What do I need to do to apply? What do I need to do to make sure that I can get this money so I can keep my payroll and keep my employees paid? And, and those are all conversations we've had constantly for the last six or seven weeks. And where I think you see that the individuals that, don't have an existing relationship with, with their bankers, they've called us and they've reached out to us and they've reached out to many, many community banks in the city. And I think they are realizing. Now, whether that's going to transform into something bigger down the road, I don't know. But I think what you're seeing is this, this, this first uh, six or seven weeks is, is definitely um, a reminder that there is a significance in having that relationship with your banker. And it doesn't even really need to be a community banker. But I think that on the community scale level, we're able to provide a little more flexibility than maybe some of the regional banks are where they're saying, here's a link, go online and apply Tyler. And you might hear back from me in two weeks or not. That's just not acceptable. If you're right. trying to keep your payroll of 40, 50, 60 employees on, 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 on a pay and you need, you need to know something immediately. I've had, I mean, even as of this past Friday when round two of the PPP uh, SBA loan rolled out again, we had, we had another, 
uh, dozen or so that we had in the pipeline, and, they, and it was it was it's updates not daily, but it's updates in some cases hourly. I've heard this is opening, Jason. I've heard this is going to open on Monday. When will this happen? Where, where do I stand in the pipeline? How 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 confident are you that we're going to get through the system? And and and, and knowing that we have the flexibility, and knowing that the fact that we were able to help so many of our customers in round one that we, we feel confident that we're able to navigate the system and get them in. And again, we started getting approvals again last night. So that's very rewarding. It's really why you, it's, it really goes back to what I mentioned maybe 15 minutes ago, of the frustration of when I worked at a bigger bank. You, you had all these different levels of I've got to go here, here, and here, and I've got to send it to this person, this person. And ultimately, I couldn't, work, I, I couldn't really manage the relationship effectively the way you can at, at a smaller community bank level, where I have the ability to have a conversation with you, Tyler, and help you directly or, or go to my boss and say, I can get this help or I need to get this help to the customer directly and not have to go through all those different levels and all those cities and all those different departments. So it, it is a tremendous thing. We saw it in 08 and 09 and 10. Uh, unfortunately, you know, short memory sometimes and, 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 you know, we get back in that habit of is it, is it significant? And, and again, there's, there's fault on the bankers. You know, you can look back and go, hey, when was the last time that I reached out to this customer? Have I been as engaged as I should have been as a banker in managing this relationship? It's a two-sided. Um, it works both ways. Yeah, no, 100%. And it's such a critical reminder for us all to invest in long-term relationships. You know, do what you can to be genuine and actually care about the other person and not look for anything in return and just continue to, you know, invest in that other person, especially when times are good. When times are good, continue to do that. Don't forget that, you know, this is all cyclical. And so when you need help the most is when you're going to want to rest on the laurels of, hey, look, I, I was investing in you and you know my attention in you and my care and whatever my network my resources whatever other things that I can provide to you are so important and uh, I really appreciate that and I just wanted to highlight that because especially in your space in in banking you know it's so important for real estate investors to establish great relationships with their bank and and communicating over communicating especially in times of challenges so I really appreciate you sharing that I'd love to if you could put your uh, your economic forecasting hat on for me here. So we've got some crazy things happening right now in the markets. Obviously, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, it seems like in some ways we've sort of done a 180 degree shift here uh, in, in, in terms of uh, continual longest expansion in American economic history now to a sudden you know halt in so many different capacities. So what are you seeing uh, in terms of actually in specifically the debt markets? What would you say the next six to 12 months holds in terms of where the Fed policy, the fiscal policy is really impacting that landscape? Well, I think, I think what you've seen over the last four weeks is, is there's a lot of fear and uncertainty. And unfortunately, that's, that's not going away. I think initially we thought, hey, if we just stop what we're doing for 15 days, then we can restart and we'll go right back to where we were in June, summer, you know, June, July, August. I, I think most people now believe that it's going to be a little, a little longer, if not a lot longer. I think that we almost have to mentally prepare uh, for the fact that it's going to be very challenging for the next six to 12 months. As far as the debt, I mean, you know, the Fed's done a great job of, of, of basically doing anything and everything they have to do to keep, to keep the economy going. Now, you know, what will happen you know, from, from all of the things they've had to do over the last six to eight weeks, we'll, we'll have to see about that. That's going to be a 2021, 2022, and, and much, much longer down that road. But I think it's, it's great to see the government working the way it has worked, to where they've said we've got to do everything we can to keep the economy going. But, but, but you know as well as I do, this economy is not built on people sitting at home. We, it's a consumer-driven economy. We need consumers out spending. We need consumers out working, earning a wage, and all those different things that we were doing before. It, it, you know, you're right. We had seen uh, the growth as far as before we hit this in January. You had you had the Dow at, at nearly thirty thousand. It dropped all the way down to eighteen thousand. It's already back up to twenty four thousand. So you've seen some st uh, stabilization there. But I think the debt level is significant. You know, you hear different opinions on on how much we can we can add on to that before it becomes a real real issue. Some already think that it's way too much, and some say, hey, if there's a demand for it, then there's a demand for it, and and ultimately. The United States economy is the world's greatest economy, and, and that, that will likely stay, stay the way or stay the course for, for many, many years. We're in a tough time, so I think that, you know, I'm an optimistic person, and initially I was, hey, this is going to be okay. 
But I think that the, the idea that you have to mentally prepare and be realistic and say, well, we're not going back to the old ways for a while. And, and the new way is going to be a little different, um, but it's okay. We're already seeing that at, and we're already seeing that at work. We're doing more zoom chats where instead of us, I mean, you and I having this conversation at our local coffee shop, we're doing it, you know, from our offices or from our households and then we're having coffee at, together but, but through zoom and so it's just gonna be a little different I think the economy I think the economy I worry though um, because I think that you've got a lot of the stimulus built in for, for right now and through the summer and then what happens what happens in June or July and I think that if you see you can see another massive wave of unemployment potentially as some of this this this, this payroll protection program is built for eight weeks and then after that what happens um, then you look at your uh, maybe your employers start to look at their um, their headcounts a little differently, and they say, "Well, that business isn't coming back as strong as they thought. Are you going to see another round of, of mass layoffs?" And, and and I think we're in for a lot of uh, we're in for a lot of uh, pain this summer and fall, and, and maybe through the rest of this year. Yeah, I think it's important um, to be a realist. Um, you know, to be an optimist to a certain degree, of course. You know, you don't want to just come out of bed every day and just think, wow, woe is me. The whole world is, you know, awful and I can't, you know, there's nothing that's going to go right today because I believe that if you have that sort of outlook, you know, that's when you have those sort of circumstances show up into your in your world in many ways. But then also, I think it's so important to be a realist and understand what should you be anticipating. And of course, there, it, it, to me, it seems there's so much validity in what you're saying in terms of the anticipation. So what can you do to strategize? What can you do to make decisions based on that reality and create opportunities? So if you were to say, what are, you know, what are some of the biggest opportunities that you see coming on the back end of this crisis for real estate investors, if you had to name any? Well, I think like anything, there, in any type of crisis, there, there, I think there's pent-up demand right now. I mean, you talk to any household and, and people are going, well, I got a stimulus check and, and maybe I haven't been directly impacted. I'm still getting paid to work from home and there hasn't, and the impact from COVID-19 hasn't been as significant uh, com compared to every household. So I think there is a pent-up demand. I mean, are you, you know, will, pe will people go back to Disney World? No, but do people want to go to the beach and social distance at the beach? Absolutely. People want to do that immediately. And so you're going to see consumers start to spend. You're already seeing them spend more. There's, Amazon's having uh, record sales. You're seeing any online realtors, uh, uh, online uh, real uh, companies are having tremendous. They're, they're having success on, on with online sales. So you're seeing. I think the pent up demand is there. It's just there's there's a lot of nervousness as far as what, how much I hold back and what I do. And now you look at the real estate side. I think that this market, as you know, the multifamily market, I think is still very strong. I think um, where I think where there's going to be some concern on the backside, it's going to be the office uh, real estate market uh, because we've already heard stories about uh, some local companies that have already decided to pull back from their, their office footprint. Do I need to have uh, 25,000 square feet of space with, with, you know, you know, hundreds of cubes everywhere when, when nearly 80% of my team now can work remotely from home. And so I think that's going to change a lot of things. It's going to change the way we work in banking. I mean, we look at the bank and I walk out and look at the lobby and we're now, the banks are open, but our lobbies are closed with appointment only trying to minimize and keep our staff healthy and keep our, our customers healthy. But you look at that and you walk out in the lobby on a Tuesday afternoon and, and, and you fast forward to what banking is going to look like in 2030 where no one's coming into the bank anymore. We've worked for almost 20 years. I've, I've been in banking 17 years. We've worked it for the entire time that I've been in banking to, to make it easier so that you as an individual or you as a company, you don't need to come into the bank and you can do all of your banking transactions from your office, from your home, from the beach, from the plane, wherever you need to do it, you can do it. And so we've changed a lot of those things. We're just accelerating some of those things now. So I think on the real estate side, I think in any type of crisis, I just mentioned the stock market. I mean, it dropped 18,000 and it's already bounced back up to 24, 24,000. So there's opportunities in any type of uh, situation for people if you're looking for, if, if you know where to do it. Now, I think on, on the real estate, I, th I think that we'll have some pullback, but, but you're in the real estate market, is, and so you know much more than I do as far as, it looks like new home sales still look pretty strong. I talk, I've got clients that deal with new construction, and there's still a demand for new construction in, 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 in this market. And, and all those demands were still there in January, and they're still there now. We've only, we've only gone four months since that time when there were all those significant de demands for we need more multifamily in Louisville, we need more, we need more homes that are uh, priced under 300000 We needed all those more single-family homes. 
that's still there. And I think now, look, is there going to be some uncertainty with the unemployment? How quickly that will bounce back? Absolutely. But I think that um, there's going to be some great buying opportunities for people. I would worry about the office real uh, market right now. I also think the commercial, commercial retail is going to be a difficult one just because um, – those guys are really hurting right now, and, and they're going to they're going to need some help uh, when they when we finally get back to some new normalcy. Yeah, and I, I appreciate your insight on all of that, and I think that the listener needs to really deeply understand their own market, their own strategy, their own approach, and the demand drivers where they are. Because we have listeners all over the United States, and really, actually, all over the world, believe it or not. And so, I think every listener has to take in the macroeconomic landscape and understand how does that impact their strategy? How does that impact their occupants and their potential new occupants in the future? And how can you pivot? How can you strategize? And also understand how the psychology of all of this is impacting yourself and your competition and your, your customers, your tenants. Um, because, you know, it's like what, what uh, Warren Buffett says, you know, be fearful when others are greedy, which others have been greedy for a very long time now, up until, you know, a couple months ago, until now, many are fearful. And so at this point, it's all right, if others are fearful, perhaps there's maybe more of a, an indication to be greedy, at least from uh, Warren Buffett's sort of philosophy there. And so how do you control your own psychology? How do you take into account all of this information and act effectively? So I appreciate you gleaning some light there on what your take is of the landscape. And, and the listener needs to do the same themselves. They need to understand deeply what is it, what does all of this impact their own strategy? So, well, uh, and, and to go back on that, I think you've seen, you know, we, we track our delinquencies week to week, you know, and actually daily, but the weekly report comes out. And so we're, we're monitoring that. But I think going back to at the end of March, early April, we, we had some customers that reached out and asked for some assistance and we gladly provided that. I think that's the thing that you have to do. Mm-hmm. If you've got somebody that's been directly impacted by this, whether it's a, whether it's a real estate investor that has a portfolio that they're in turn going to turn around and help their tenants, then we need to help them as well. And it's, it's, it's everybody helping everybody. But to the opposite side of that, if you've not been directly impacted and, and, and you're still getting paid every other week and you still are lucky to have a job and you're in good health and your family's in good health, you still need to be making those monthly obligations as well. Yeah. And that's another example of investing in other relationships, because I think in this type of circumstance, it really shows who people really are. And people are going to remember, how did you act during this time? How did you act when the chips were falling? And, you know, did you act, you know, crazy and out of control or were you measured and were you realistic and were you thoughtful of how this is impacting everyone else? So I really appreciate you bringing that up. So Jason, I want to switch gears just a little bit. I want to talk about yourself and how you invest in your own personal growth. You know, one thing that you and I have been uh, really passionate about sharing with each other is, is books and reading. How else are you investing in yourself and your own development? So, you know, um, before I jump into the books, you know, I, 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 I think I talked about work. I used to get up maybe five every morning and I'd be in the office by six and I would do a lot of different, uh, whether it was paperwork or, or start to plan my day, pre-plan my day. I was always planning everything before. But, but now I, I get up early. I still get up at five, four fifty-five every morning, and I head to a local park or or, or a church parking lot, and we you know work out with a bunch of guys. We do we, we do fitness. So fitness is something that's pretty new to me. I've been doing it now for probably about three years, and and that's the one part of my life that's really changed. I get a great energy boost from working out every single day. You know, I work out with a lot of different guys that that, that have a lot of different. Uh, everyone, every single person that we work out with is a little different. And there's some that are just excellent shape. There's some that are in good shape. There's some that are in average shape. There's some that are in terrible shape. <laughs> and it comes in all different varieties, but it's, it's a great fellowship. It's a great, uh, I mean, you see, you know, I read, you, you read these CNBC articles of how the eight most successful people start their day. Or you read, and a lot of it is, 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 is there's a fitness component first thing in the morning or it's, or it's meditation, but it's, it's doing something for themselves before they start their day. And so that's been a big change in my life for the last three years where I was very active in, in the morning before, but it was just work. It was just me throwing myself back into work. And so now it's, it's me uh, setting aside an hour where I can work out that doesn't impact my, my, my wife's schedule or my kid's schedule. And, and then it's, and it's my time to do what I need to do. And it is a tremendous boost. And, you know, I get people – uh, I go nearly every morning, and 
I'm not the best at doing push-ups. I'm not the best at jump rope. I'm not the best at a lot of things. Actually, I'm very, very good at, I'm not very good at really anything. And I think <laughs> the only thing I'm really, really good at is, is showing up. And so, and there's, there's, there's something to be said for that. I think that goes back to what I try to do is, is I think in, in my life as, as a community banker, as a professional, Tyler, I've just tried to be consistent. And, and if you're consistent with your prospecting, if you're consistent with your learning, if you're consistent with, sorry, no if, if you're consistent with all those different things that you're trying to do and you do it daily, the problem is most people just can't do it. They can't hold themselves to do it every single day or every single week and every single month. And, and that goes back to uh, the workout group. So, you know, they, 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 we all tease each other. And again, there's, there's people that can do some amazing things and there's some that can't, but, but uh, I'm, I'm, I always tell people I'm just really good at showing up. And, and, and that's something I am proud about. I'm, you know, I, I get there in the morning and I'm ready to work. And, and then when I get, when I, when I'm finished, I'm, I'm really, the days that I skip, it's unbelievable. You wouldn't think that by running three or four miles, you would come, you would, you would get home and have more energy. But the days I skip and I don't do that, I'm missing something in that morning and there's not anything I can do to catch up. Yeah, no, I love that. And I can totally relate myself when I learned more about how exercise and fitness impacts my mind. You know, it was like, I can be more effective at what I do professionally because I was always so driven to achieve professionally. But then when I learned that if I can achieve my fitness goals, I can more so achieve what I want to do professionally. So, you know, I'd love to know just a little bit deeper on the theory of, all right, I'm going to invest in myself professionally in the morning as you did before versus I'm going to invest in my own health and my own fitness and the future of my longevity, so to speak, and then the capacity of my mind. How has that impacted your results uh, that you've seen over the past few years? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's great that you would ask that because some people say, look, you're, you're, you're carving out maybe an hour every morning and maybe sometimes you're doing some, some other things. But, you know, personally, as me as an individual banker, uh, we've, we've never over the last three years since I started my new workouts and, and committed more to eating better and, and, and getting more sleep and, 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 and um, drinking a lot of water throughout the day and just all the different things. I mean, I'm, I'm not a fitness junkie, but I love the idea of being in better shape. Everything you do feels better. And, and, and whether it's going for a walk, you feel better if you're in better shape. And even working and sleeping and everything you do is, is a direct result of that. So um, the, the results for the market, the results for me individually as a banker have been excellent. And we've had record growth year over year over year. So that's great. Now, I'm, I'm a little worried about what will happen this year. But, you know, I think that this year is, is, is going to be a tough year for so many people. And I'm not worried about that right now. I want to make sure that we can keep our team healthy, our customers healthy. And we as a community rebound as quickly as we can. So, yeah. um, but, but I think the fitness is, is so important. I look at uh, so many people and and, and what I've tried to do individually is encourage more people to, to take the, the path that I did, which is I was not, I'm not a lazy person, but the one, the one weakness I did have uh, probably going back three years ago, if we were doing this conversation three years ago was I didn't really have that fitness component and I didn't have an interest in doing it. And I didn't, I didn't have the, the, the internal drive to do it. Yeah. And now when I get home from work later today, I'm going to, we're going to eat dinner and then I'm going to walk up the street with the kids and we're going to, we're going to do some push-ups up at the up at the park. We're going to we're going to find a tree that we can do some pull-ups on, and and we're all going to do it as a family and, and have a fun time doing it. And then it's just been it's, it's been fun to do. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I, a couple of things I wanted to just mention on this is I, I heard this quote and I may butcher it as I do most quotes, but it said, if it's not sustainable, it's not successful. And I think that's where it comes to the consistency that you just mentioned. You know, your superpower is consistency. You may not be, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger in many different ways, but you show up and when you can sustain that effort over a long period of time, that's when it becomes successful. So I just really honored that. And then also, I think that fitness and, and many things that you can do to invest in your own health also is like one of those keystone habits that then become greater things in other things that you do. Like you're willing to face a little bit of discomfort and perhaps mm -hmm. you don't enjoy doing push-ups, but you know that it's w much worse in your mind than it is actually in practice. So then it's like, oh, I'm reminded that, you know what, I do want to pick up the phone and have that phone call. It may be a challenging discussion. I may have to do a negotiation that makes me feel uncomfortable or, or I may need to share news with a colleague that is uncomfortable or, you know, not pleasant. But I remembered that I'm willing to do uncomfortable things and I feel better afterwards. And so I just think it's such a, you know, 
it's a practice that everyone listening should engage in because of that fact alone. Obviously your health and the investing in the long term of your health is so important as well. But but I really appreciate that. So Jason, talk to me, what would you say is one way that you're getting 1% better daily? Um, you know, that's one of the, one of my mantras is how can I show up today and just, let's just get 1% better. What can I do to compound my efforts and improve? What would you say is something that you you would point to? Well, I mean, I think it, it would probably be similar to maybe how you would answer this. It's, it's a, it's a constant desire to continue to learn. I mean, I love, I love reading and I love learning. So, you know, four or five years ago, I had two phones and I'm on my, I'm in the car and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take notes and I'm, I'm calling customers and I'm returning phone calls and I stopped then and I, and I started listening to podcasts and I started where I was like, you know, I, I can spend 40 minutes from, from this appointment to the next appointment and I can maybe take some nuggets from this, this individual podcast and apply it to something I'm going to do today or, or next week or later. And every morning when I get in the office, it's, it's not pulling up my email, but it's pulling up uh, it's pulling up the websites that I read to catch up on articles. And, 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 and then the same in the evening when I go to bed, it's, it's picking up a couple books that I'm reading right now and going through those and reading a couple chapters and just trying to learn more. And I think that, I think that leadership and good leaders and uh, they never stop. And, and I love it. Uh, you know, I, I want to be, uh, I want to be the best banker possible and I can't be the best banker possible to my clients or my team is if I should, if, if I'm not constantly trying to get better, and, and that's really just learning more. I mean, there's a lot to do. And, and, and two, you and I are both in very competitive professional fields. And if we want to be the best at what we have to do, what we're doing, and, and the best, uh, the best way to serve our clients, we've got to get better. And 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 it can't be getting better one one week and then taking a week off. It's a daily process, and it goes back to consistency. You have to have those routines. You have to have those plans, and you have to stick to them. You know, I'm I'm really tight with my schedule, and and I and I, I do that because. Some people tease me about it, but I have to stay on it because it keeps me focused and it keeps me on track and it allows me to do those things so that I am getting better. This episode of Elevate is brought to you by CF Capital, a real estate investment firm formed by myself and my partner, Brian Flaherty, where we invest in multifamily real estate communities across the Southeast United States. If you'd like to learn more about our approach, our mission, our acquisition criteria, and how you can learn more about future opportunities, Visit cfcapllc.com. Again, that's cfcapllc.com. Yeah, and I, I, there's one thing there that really stuck out to me is that, you know, as real estate investors or real estate professionals, that we're, it's all about relationships, right? It's all about investing in those relationships. But one thing you mentioned there that was so key, and it's actually something that I applied a few years ago as well, is if I'm driving to and from an appointment or from a meeting or whatever it may be, you know, before it was like, all right, I got to catch up on my voicemails or return, return phone calls or take phone calls. And of course, there's certainly a time and place to be taking phone calls. You need to be available. You need to be conversing and having those conversations and, and investing in those relationships. But I also think it's so important to be able to maybe batch that time and particularly schedule that out in a particular way, but then also continuing to invest in your own learning. And what a better way to learn than listen to a great podcast, listen to Elevate Podcast or whatever it may be, and That's listen to true. a book or invest in reading a book or having a great conversation like this. Um, there's so many ways that you can invest in lifetime learning, lifetime growth, rather than just you know, uh, you know, something that's going to keep you on top of things today, I think is so important, you know, because we can stay on defense all the time, but how do we get on offense? How do we shift to get into offense? So uh, I really admire that. What's, um, what's well, you know, just, if you go back, if, if you go back to that, Tyler, I mean, you know, we're very, we're, we're so blessed and lucky are we that, that we live in a time where you can, where, where you can have access to where talks at Goldman Sachs or, 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 or leadership podcasts like David Novak, where he has some of the, some of the, the best leaders in, in the entire country on his show and you get 60 minutes one-on-one -on -one with those guys, you know, so we have access to that daily. And, and not only that, but there's, 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 there, it's almost too much access, right? There's, there's yeah. it's almost hard to, to stay on top of it all because whether it's the podcast or the books or, or the, the blogs and all the other stuff, there, there's really no excuse for you not to, because it's unbelievable the, the amount of content that's available for you to constantly, for the top real estate professionals in, in the world. They've got podcasts, they have blogs, they have websites. You can, you can stay in touch with them 
in ways that we never could have 20 years ago. So yeah. those are significant advantages that we're very lucky to have. We should absolutely, if, you, if you're in, if you want to get better, you have to take advantage of those. Yeah. There's no excuse, but to take action on the information too, because knowledge is only potential power. You know, the action is real, the real power. So taking action on the information that you take, and that's why we always say, you know, identify, but then apply how the best of the best raise the bar personally and professionally in real estate and beyond. Because if you're just listening, you're just consuming, then it's dead weight. It's like, it's like drinking a protein shake without working out. It's like, <laughs> that's nothing, not going to do anything for you. So um, talk to me, what are you most excited about these days, Jason? You know, I'm, I'm excited about, you know, it's, it's crazy to say, because even as, 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 as uncertain, you know, the times run right now with, you know, what's going to happen, you know, week to week, we don't know, you know, I, I go back to, to why I started what I, what I'm doing. I, I love what I'm, I love what I'm doing. I mean, right now we're on the front lines of we're and as you mentioned, just to back this up, we are so appreciative and thankful for those essential workers, the nurses, the doctors truly on the front lines. We, we played a small part, but, but we've been able to work with these business owners and, and help in ways that I didn't think we would ever be able to help. And, that's been unbelievable to see and participate in. And something that, just as you've seen it after the fallout of 2008, 2009 with the Great Recession, and you saw behind the scenes how TARP worked and how the bailouts worked and ultimately how those programs were profitable. Now, these programs will not be profitable like TARP was, but, but ultimately, you know, we'll be reading and talking about the, 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 these times for, uh, for, for many years, decades to come. And, and hopefully, uh, we never have to go through something like this again. I really hope and pray we don't. But it, but but I'm I'm excited. Every day has been has been a, a challenge. But 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 you know, in, in a lot of ways, Tyler, I prepared for that. I mean, you get up in the morning, you know, kind of. I'm pre planning my day. I know what we have to do, and 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 and, and you just do it. And so it's been it's been great, very rewarding, um, challenging uh, four or six you know four to five weeks. But but um, but I feel good about what we're doing. The team is. I mean, our team is working amazing. They're working behind the scenes. We've got guys working. Uh, late through the night to do applications. We've got Easter weekend, we were doing applications all weekend. We were just doing anything we could to help these customers out and just trying to do our part. Yeah, it's really cool to look back in, in extremely challenging times and just see how proud you can be of the effort and what you've been able to overcome. So I think reminding ourselves of that when we're going through extreme challenges is that, you know, these are going to be times that you're going to be most proud of yourself and what can you do to rise to the occasion and continue to push through and not give up because, you know, all of these circumstances are opportunities for us to recognize that, you know, this is an opportunity for us to learn and to grow and to become more and to become more effective and to gain more experience and put that on our experience tool belt. And so, you know, I, I just honor that as well. I know I've said that many times, but you're, you're speaking some knowledge to me today, Jason. I really appreciate that. Uh, with that said, I want to transition into our rapid fire section. We call it the rare air questionnaire. And, you know, it's all about becoming great and becoming striving for excellence and raising the bar, continuing to push forward and, and scale the mountaintop and look across the valley there and recognize that there's a few more mountaintops for us to scale. And, um, you know, one of the things that you and I connected on, you know, so deeply early on in our relationship, of course, is books. So I'd love to know if you were to point to two or three of the most impactful books that you've read, what would those be and why? Well, you know, the, uh, I'm, 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 I try not to be jealous of people, but I am, I am jealous when I see you post a LinkedIn uh, post that's got the five most books, recent books that you've read. And, and I've only like knocked out one in a month. <laughs> So I, I love that you're able to read so much and, and I love to read too. It's one of my favorite things to do. I don't get to, I hate it when we get kind of, when we get drug into a Netflix show because it eats into my reading time. And so I, ch I try to stay, stay out of that and, and, and read as much as possible. You know, I think some of the books that I've really, I, mean, I, I love, I, I've read a lot of finance books and banking books and, I'm, and, and, and a lot of them, if you looked at my, if you went to work and I'm, and I'm a hard, I like to own the copy. I like to own the books too. Me too. My wife's Kindle and she, and she's, she got, a, she got the Kindle going and I got, I've got the hard copy and I love buying books. It's one of my favorite things to do on Amazon is to get a new book and we cannot wait for it to be delivered. I've got a few more on the way right now, but some of, some of my favorite books, I think um, going back through the list, I would say, um, yeah, I love Steve Jobs' book. I, I thought that was very inspirational, just because you just you get a glimpse into his mind of that. You talk about somebody that that if you could interview for a podcast today, and you look at what we're going through right now, like what what would he, how would he handle this? And yeah. uh, and you have no doubt that he would do uh, amazing amazing work in, in leading his team through these challenging times. 
And it's just fascinating to get in, to get into the mind of someone like that. You know, so Steve Jobs' book was excellent. Um, I liked, um, I love the book Janesville, and and I, I look back on that book because I, with some regret because I didn't want to buy it because it just it had just come out two years ago, and I wanted and I'd heard good things about it. And it was a cold winter. It was a, it was a terribly cold winter, but I was being cheap. And I couldn't, I couldn't get it for under like $20 and I've got a rule about how much I want to spend on books. <laughs> so I got it from the library, which was great. And I read it like in three days and it was like one of my favorite books and, and it's an excellent book. So if, if anybody listening today has never, never read the book, Janesville, it's based on the economic fallout from, uh, from the, the, the great recession in 2008 that carried into 2010 in, uh, in a town in Wisconsin, Janesville, Wisconsin. So it's excellent. It goes behind the scenes, and, and it's an, one of my favorite books. It's sad, but it, but it's compelling. It's one of those books you just can't put down. You just go. I'd, I'd, I'd read a chapter and then tell my wife, "You won't believe what happened in this chapter to this this family or this individual." And so it was one of those different books. And then um, you know maybe uh, in the financial crisis, I think I've read every book possible, which is like like a hundred of them, and I own nearly all of them. So if I had to narrow it down from 08 to 09, which I find very fascinating because, again, I was a young banker. I was a 26, 27-year-old naive banker. And I was like, hey, this is crazy. And then we were kind of, we were, you know, we weren't in New York City on the front lines, but we were all internal. You know, every bank was doing their part back then, too. It was very, very uncertain times. And, you know, were banks going to be nationalized? And what was going to happen? You know, we saw massive uh, unemployment. And just bad news everywhere uh, for, for six straight months. And then it, it lingered on for a good two to three years after that. But it may be too big to fail. Um, that would maybe be the one that I like out of, out of all of those. But there's some excellent ones that are in there. And, and again, I, there's, there's probably been 100 or so written that I will maybe 80 of them. And, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I can't, again, I can't wait. You know, it's <laughs> one of those things. I'm, like I said, I, I'm always interested to see what you're reading. I always love when you post your LinkedIn updates of what you've knocked out. and and what's next on your list. So I appreciate you doing that. Keep doing it. Keep sharing that because I've picked up a few from you and, and, uh, and I've really enjoyed that one part of our relationship is, is talking about books. And, and sometimes it's for enjoyment and sometimes it's a mix. Of, it's, it's, I like finding books where I'm, where I'm getting better. I can, mm -hmm. can kind of get a glimpse into this leader's mind or this, or this organization. But also, again, how can I apply that to the things that I'm doing? And, and you just never know when you're going to need some of these things. You just don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And and I don't know about you, but the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And so to me, that's fun because I'm growing as an individual. And what can you do to structure the fun of your life around growing and learning and, and becoming more? And, you know, a book is such a great resource. It's such a gift because, you know, whoever wrote that book, you know, really put their life's work into that collection, those collection of pages. So what can you do to download really decades into days into your own mind, into your own arsenal to be able to act better, to be able to act more effectively, to be able to capture more opportunities. So that's why I'm such a great proponent of reading. And uh, it is so much fun to me as well. So what is the, uh, Jason, what, what would you say the biggest way that you elevate your life on a daily basis is outside of what we've already talked about today? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm very blessed. You know, I, I wake up every morning and, and I've got, um, I, what I have been able to achieve has, has been through a lot of hard work and discipline and consistency. And, and I know that um, it, it didn't come easy and, 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 and I've got to stay focused on uh, not, not things that I did yesterday or last week or last year or two years ago. It's, it's about moving forward and, and, and we're in challenging times now, but, but also again, you know, the way that we do banking now is not the way we did 20 years ago and the way that we're going to be doing banking uh, now, and with, compared to what we're going to be doing uh, over the next 10 years, it's going to be very different, right? As technology continues to evolve, and even the coronavirus continues to impact all of our lives. You know, so you've got to stay, you've, you've got to stay so committed to getting better. And so every day, you, you have to look at that as an opportunity. We talked about learning every day. And then again, just showing up ready to work. I prepare every day that, that you know, I always mentally prepare that it's going to be a challenging day. So that if it's not a challenging day, I go, well, that wasn't too bad. And I drive home and I feel pretty good about it. And if it was a challenging day, I said, well, you know, I was ready for this day. And I feel pretty good about how we handled it. So I think that it's just mentally how you prepare each day. You know, again, I talked about uh, getting up early in the morning and getting a workout in. And that's one of those selfish things I think everybody should try to do is, is mm -hmm. carve out, whether it's working out or meditation or yoga or whatever it is, something that you can do on your own 
to kind of recharge yourself and get and, get, and prepare for the day. And, and I think that we have so many people that come in um, that, um, that, that, you know, I think I mentioned just show, I'm just really good at showing up. We have some people that just can't even show up. <laughs> and it's terrible that people, you know, I think it's the easiest part of the day is getting to work on time and, and, and getting to your appointments on time and, and setting a schedule and setting goals and having daily goals for that matter, Tyler. So we have, we, we have a lot of people, when you look at just the basics of elevating, I think that, I, I think it's, I think some of it's basic one-on-one. I mean, yes, you can, you can equate it to outworking the guy next to you or outworking your competitors. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's probably the, the foundation of it, but, it, but it's also, you know, showing up and consistently showing up on time, consistently uh, outworking your competitors, consistently outworking even the guy in the office next to you. I mean, that, that's, that's, that, those are the things that have to be done if, if you really want to elevate and, and go to the next level. Yeah. One of the things that just strikes me about you is that it's just consistent preparation in all different capacities, whether it's preparing yourself to be, you know, a healthy individual for the long term, or preparing yourself with an arsenal of knowledge to be able to take effective action when that knowledge is appropriately, you know, used, you know, because you read a book and it's like, you don't need every single piece of information in that book that moment, but you may in the future. And then also preparing yourself mentally for your day, preparing yourself mentally to say, Hey, this may be a challenging day. So how am I going to react? How am I going to act? So giving yourself time and space to think about how are you going to act? How are you going to show up? And then just showing up. I love that. I love that. And, and I just, to me, it just strikes me that it's all about preparation. It's all about consistency and it's all about just showing up and, and, and doing your best. So I really honor you for that again. And talk to me, what's the biggest way that you elevate others around you, Jason? Well, I think, you know, you have to look at uh, the way you manage other, your team is that, you know, you can't, you, you, everyone's different, right? And, and everyone's driven differently as well. So you have to, you have to, you can't have one, you know, one, one size fits all approach. And, and I think that the one thing you want to do with your team is you've got to give them the ability to, to make their own decisions. You know, I always like when someone will come to me with a question and they'll say, you know, what do you think I should do here? And, you know, my first response is after, after kind of walking through the situation with them and looking at the information that we have is, is asking them, well, what do you think? You know, and then, and then putting it back on them because I want to know, you know, you've, you've already thought about this and what ideas or suggestions you have on, on how we can fix this. So I think that, I, I think empowering your team to, to, to make decisions, to, to, to actually have a real voice. And that goes back to the community bank part. I look at it all the time. I, I, I work with 30 individuals here in the local market. And, and if, if we just use my ideas only, that would be a terrible way to manage and lead this team. I mean, I've got 30 talented individuals. I need to talk to those guys and ask them questions because you never know who's got the right answer or who's got, or who's got the, the – wow, what an unbelievable concept. How can we apply that to what we're doing here at the bank and, and, and make, make this easier for our customers? Or can we apply this product – to our bank and make it easier for our customers. You know, there's all these different things you have to do, but I think that the, the main thing you can do as a leader is just ask your, you know, be, be engaged, you know, give your employees the opportunity to, um, to, to truly have a voice. And, you know, we always say truly, but we always make decisions and say, well, we're going to make this decision and then go and, and how it directly impacts those people. And yet in, in many cases, we don't even ask the people that it's being impacted upon. Right. So I always say, we're talking about it right now about reopening, you know, the bank lobbies. And I said, well, let's ask our guys on the front line how they feel about what type of protective measures they would want. So they have a real voice in what that looks like, not just an executive management team making that decision and saying this is what it's going to look like, you know, in mid-May, but, but letting them decide what, what, what they think it should look like. And so that they feel safe and, and they had a voice and they were heard in the process. Yeah. And isn't it interesting when you ask those questions, you get great answers too, and you get great, great strategy. So it's yes. not even just the practice of being a great leader and really just doing the right thing from that capacity, but you actually get great decisions when you engage your team. So I, I love that. And it's a great reminder for us all because we don't have all the right answers. Nobody has all the answers. So what can you do to facilitate and allow people to step up to the plate and become their greatest selves as well? So so Jason, this has been awesome. Really, really appreciate you taking time. Is there any parting thoughts or words of wisdom that you share with Elevate Nation today? You know, Tyler, I would say that, um, I, I'm, again, I'm a big fan of, of, of Elevate and your podcast and, and really a, a fan of you and what you're doing and, and your professional career and, and how hard you work. And, and uh, you, you're definitely a role model to many people here in this, in this, in, in, in our city, but, but also expanding with this podcast. So, 
I go back to, you know, I'm, I, the highlight of my year is being asked to do this. So it's a tremendous honor. I hope I didn't come off as the boring banker you know, that's, that's in there just planning everything. Every, every hour of my, my day is being planned because I do like to have fun. And, and, uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm very blessed. I've got a great wife, two amazing kids, a great extended family as well. And, uh, and a great group of friends that, that I'm thankful for. So, um, you know, I hope everyone who's watching this now is, is, uh, is, uh, healthy and, and staying safe and doing the best they can during these uncertain times and, uh, and, and, and recognize that there are some, some, uh, some opportunities that are going to, that are going to happen. And I think with the right mindset that, that everyone's going to be ready to get back to work. And if you're not already back to work, but it's going to be a challenging couple of months and challenging couple, uh, maybe years. But I think that, uh, I would continue to say, you know, if you're in a leadership position, you need to lead from the front, you know, your team needs you and they need that positivity. And so, you know, you need to be the energy and the, and the, pos the positivity in the room, uh, in the office, and wherever you are, and and, and likewise at, at home. You know, uh, lead from lead that lead that same way at home as well, so you can be that example for your kids and, and your family as well. Well, thank you for setting such a great example today, Jason, and leading from the front. Uh, it's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure to really sit down with you today. Uh, tell the listeners how they can learn more about what you do and learn more about Fork Bank and everything that's going on in Jason Stucker's life. Well, Tyler, anybody that, that, that would want to reach out to me directly can do it. I've got a LinkedIn profile that I'm pretty active with. It's, it's my first and last name, Jason Stucker. It's spelled S-T-U-E-C-K-E-R. And I'm happy to be, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty engaged on LinkedIn. And then um, uh, the bank's website is forkbank.com. It's F O R C H T bank.com. And uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me, reach out to me on LinkedIn or even my cell phone, which I'm happy. I've been giving this out, Tyler. I did a commercial. You won't believe this. Wow. Seven years ago when I started at Fourth Bank, the little bank, no one had heard of. We got this weird name, funny name. I'll keep this real short. <laughs> and they said, you can't. And they said, they said, what would you do? I said, well, I'm going to get my cell phone out on, on this radio commercial. I want people to call me anytime. I'll return your call anytime. Call me. And so I gave my cell phone number out, 502-819-2221. I thought that was really fun. I ended up getting a lot of terrible pranks, um, but I'm still happy to give it out anytime because I think in, it, what we've seen over the last couple of weeks is, is, is having that relationship with the bank uh, and your banker, having the access to where you can pick up the phone and call them has been a tremendous benefit and it's something that maybe we had maybe forgotten about. And it's nice to know that, uh, that we can still do that. So I'm happy to talk to anybody that has any questions about anything, regardless of where they're at uh, in the country. All right. He didn't consult me on that one. So if, if his phone gets overwhelmed, uh, you know, to, like a crazy, in a crazy <laughs> capacity, then, hey, you didn't, he didn't ask me. So, but uh, I love it. So if you, if you want to reach out, I mean, there's direct access to Mr. Sucker there. So certainly uh, reach out to him directly. And, and again, I mean, this has been an episode where we talk about genuine leadership, where we talk about consistency, where we talk about so many great Thing. So you want to go ahead and re-listen to this show because as we always mention, repetition is the mother of all skill. And I don't know about you, but every single time I read a book, I learn something new. You know, if I reread a book, it's like, wow, I didn't even know I read this book. And I know that's the same with listening to a podcast. And certainly this one, there's so many gold nuggets in there. If you want to build a long, sustainable business and a long, sustainable, successful real estate portfolio, you need to re-listen to the show and you need to build a relationship with Jason. So I highly encourage you to do that. And also take notes. You know, what are your top three distinctions? What can you take action on now? What can you do to share this with someone else as well? Because as we all know, the teacher is who learns the most. How can you be a leader? How can you ask questions based on our discussion today? And if you're on social media, screenshot the show, uh, tag Jason. If you're on LinkedIn, you want to tag him there, tag somebody else as well. Pay it forward because that's how you're going to invest in long-term relationships is by giving to other people. So give the gift of this episode with someone else. But most importantly, take massive action. And uh, with that said, Jason, thanks again for being on the show. Thank you, Tyler. Absolutely. Elevate Nation, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Elevate. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to elevate your results by taking immediate action on what you learned. For more, visit elevatepod.com.